Welcome everyone to Africa Elta webinars. Uh, we have a guest today, our presenter, Virginia. You're welcome. And my name is Irene Maganga. I'll be moderating the session. So I'll start by introducing our presenter. Uh, Virginia Nikolai has a master's of arts in applied linguistics and more than 50 years of experience teaching English on five continents. Uh, from September, 2021, to July 2022, she served as an English language fellow with PK Fokam Institute of Excellence and the US Embassy in Yaounde, Cameroon. She is currently an associate professor of English as a second language at Colorado Mountain College in USA. She has presented and at conferences and workshops for various teacher associations, including Africa Elta, Camelta, Colorado Teachers of English to Speakers of Other Languages and TESO International Association, in addition to leading the organizing committee of the 2022 West Africa TESO Conference. Virginia, we all welcome. Thank you the so floor, much, Irene. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And greetings to everybody from cold and snowy Colorado. I'm in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado in the USA right now. And thank you to the Africa Elta professional development team for inviting me to present this webinar today. Um, it, it truly is an honor to spend time with all of my great colleagues around the world. And I see many of you here on Zoom and then we're live on Facebook as well. So hello to everybody wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so that everyone can see my PowerPoint. And there it is. Um, so the topic today that I'll be talking about is seven tried and true stat strategies for student interaction. And I'm gonna share some of my favorite strategies to get students to interact more. So I've used these throughout my 15 years of teaching English. And the thing is, they always work. That's why I love these strategies. And they may or may not be new to you. Uh, maybe you're familiar and, and maybe you've used some of them already. But either way, I hope you'll find an activity today that you can use immediately in your own classroom on Monday. So in the session today. Um, we will discuss first the benefits of student-centered communicative language teaching that lowers the effective filter. So we'll talk more about that. And like I said, I'm going to share seven strategies and activities to increase student interaction, which can be adapted for different uh, kinds of content, different levels of English, and different class sizes. So uh, all of these strategies can be used in many different ways, and we'll talk about that. All right, I'm going to start with a little warm up, a little icebreaker. And here are three statements about me. Uh, two of them are true, and one is not. And so one is false, one is a lie. And in this game, you have to figure out which statement is not true, which is the lie. So normally, um, I would, uh, to make this more interactive, I would have you ask me different WH questions to try to figure out which one is the lie. So for example, someone might ask me, hmm, when did you live in Cameroon? And I would answer, well, I lived there uh, from last September in 2021 until July of this year. So now you know number two is true because of my answer. So um, I'm not going to have you ask me questions, though, because Irene gave such a wonderful introduction. So you probably know which one is not true. So go ahead and in the uh, chat, you can uh, put your guess. Which one is the lie? Number one? or number three, because I told you number two is true. <laughs> so I see a couple of people put two. Two is actually true. So which one is the lie, number one or number three? 
I see a few guesses coming in. Oh, I see some, I see some people know, <laughs> some people listened to the introduction. Mm -hmm. I think I see many people put number one. And if you put number one, you are correct. <laughs> so number one was not true. I have a master of arts in applied linguistics. So don't worry, you don't need to call me doctor. <laughs> it's okay, I'm not a doctor, but uh, my focus is on teaching. I love teaching. And um, so my focus is not on doing research, but we're going to talk about some research today that supports the best practices in our teaching. So that um, quick little game was the first strategy that maybe you've used this game before in your class. It is called Two Truths and a Lie. And um, so I'd like you to think about this activity that we just did. How is that different from having each student in your class introduce themselves? You know, often when we start a new class, we want to get to know all the students. Um, you could just have everyone go around and introduce themselves, but how, how was two truths and a lie a little bit different? So if you have an idea, please type in the chat. What do you think? So instead of just saying, you know, I, I could give an introduction like, hello, my name is Virginia. I am from the United States and I teach English. But instead, we had those different uh, two truths and a lie. Oh, and I see um, one comment from Zaki. It makes it more entertaining and engaging. Great. And I see from Jennifer, it keeps the introduction shorter and it draws more entertaining information, great. And I'm seeing some more comments about making it more exciting and people are thinking actively trying to guess the lie, great. I love that, it's more interactive, it's fun. Yeah, thank you everybody. Makes the class interesting, I love those answers, yeah. So um, like you were saying, students have to listen actively, they have to think about the different statements and um, normally I would have the students asking questions and then answering them. And um, there's more communication, more interaction, like you all said, and it's a bit more creative and fun because they have to guess the lie. So this activity could be adapted in different ways. Here are a few ideas that I have, and please feel free to share any ideas that you have as well in the chat. But um, you know, instead of doing it with the whole class, you could have students work in small groups, especially if you have a very big class. Um, the statements that they give about themselves could be simple or complex, depending on their level. And you could even focus on specific grammar points. So often when I'm teaching present perfect in my grammar class, I have the students write three statements using present perfect about their experience. Uh, and then we do two truths and a lie. You know, for example, I have, I have traveled to 10 countries, for example, could be a present perfect statement. And um, if you're studying a particular topic, they could create statements around that topic. So this doesn't only have to be an icebreaker. You could use this at any point in your class to review a topic, review vocabulary that you've taught, or to focus on a particular grammar point. Now, we, we started talking about how that activity uh, is more student-centered. And in terms of student-centered teaching, here are two pictures from my time in Cameroon. Which picture do you think shows a more student-centered classroom? So please type in the chat. And I see a couple of people typing two. Oh, a lot of twos. A lot of people saying two, which I agree. I agree with you on number two. So uh, in picture number one, I was actually invited to give a presentation. So it, it was a bit less interactive. Um, and so why is number two more student-centered? You know, think about what are the students doing? That's what I try to remember in my teaching, not what am I doing, but what are the students doing? And in number one, 
they're sitting and listening. It's a bit more passive. They're, they're receiving information. And then in number two, they're just listening exactly in the chat. I agree. And in number two, the students are talking to each other. They're using the language. They're interacting. They're being much more active, right? So they, yeah, exactly. In the chat, they're discussing amongst themselves. It's, it's not the teacher leading. It's the students being fully involved, exactly. Yes, involved in their learning. So related to that, um, as the research shows, according to Jack C. Richards, the role of the teacher in the language classroom is that of a facilitator who provides opportunities for students to use and practice the language. So that's our goal, right? And why? <laughs> so, you know, that's our goal, but why? Why is having a student-centered classroom beneficial to our students? And um, in the picture, you can see some of my very happy students in Cameroon at the U.S. Embassy in, in Yaoundé. So anyone have any ideas about that? First, I'd like you to think. Okay, so take a minute to think about that question. Now, if we were together in person, um, I would ask you to turn to a partner and talk to share your ideas first. Um, but since we're online, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and share with the group by typing in the chat what ideas you have about student-centered classrooms? How are they beneficial to students? And I see some great answers here that um, it gives them self-confidence. Exactly, that's one of our goals, right? A few people said that, um, that they're interacting with each other. It cultivates creativity, that's great. They're using the language in real time. I love that, yes, yes. They feel more concerned. They're, yeah, they're, they're thinking more about what um, they're doing in class. They're expressing themselves, yes. They're showing their skills, great. Critical thinking, that's, that's an excellent point as well. And they're participating in the learning process, yes, because we want them to be active participants in their own learning, not just sitting there and being told what, what they should know. Right, they're experimenting. Oh, there's so many great answers. I, I wish I could read all of them, but since our time is limited, um, I'm just gonna move on to talk about how what we just did was strategy number two, think, pair, share. And, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this and use it in your own classroom to make things more student-centered. It's one of my favorite strategies when you're discussing anything, when you're working on anything in your class, you can give your students a little time to think first, then have them talk to a partner so that they can share their ideas together, create meaning together, and, and feel more confident in their answer before you then share with the group. So um, like we, we talked about um, building confidence in their language and their answer, before they have to speak in front of the whole class, which can be a bit scarier, right? So I, that's a, a favorite of mine, definitely. So students benefit from all the things that you mentioned, right? They're getting to know each other. That builds community in your classroom. They're interacting instead of just passively listening. They're having more opportunities for communication, for using the language and they're engaged, which increases their motivation too. And then they feel more comfortable and confident. If you give them the opportunity in small groups, they that can make them feel a little bit more comfortable and confident before talking to the whole class. So um, communicative language teaching is a very popular uh, methodology in English language teaching. And um, so on, your Zoom, uh, you should be able to give a reaction. Um, so could you please give me a thumbs up if your answer is yes to the question, do you use communicative language teaching? Are you familiar with, with that? Do you already use that? And I see some thumbs up in the chat, great, awesome. I think this is a very popular common uh, teaching methodology, right? Great. And I see many of you are using it already. 
So just to, to remind us all, um, why is communicative language teaching so popular? Second language learning is facilitated when learners are engaged in interaction and meaningful communication. So that comes from Jack C. Richards again, that is not brand new research, um, but it's tried and true, which, which is the focus of, of our webinar today, right? Um, it, it, this works. So our students need to communicate and interact and collaborate in order to acquire the, the language. And so uh, Richards also says that we teachers should make real communication the focus and provide opportunities for learners to experiment, which many of you mentioned in the chat. Um, we should allow them to make mistakes, right? Mistakes are good. It helps them learn and provide opportunities to develop both accuracy and fluency. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. And then also giving them practice with all the different language skills like speaking, reading, and listening all together because in the real world, we don't do those things separately. We do them together. So we want to give practice with that in our classroom. Another concept that comes into play with student-centered interactive activities is the effective filter. So again, could you please give me a thumbs up if you have heard of the effective filter. So thumbs up, have you heard of the effective filter? No, oh, okay, I see some thumbs up, some down. So this might be a new idea for some people. Um, so let me explain the effective filter describe, oh, and some people, yes, great. So the effective filter describes how a learner's attitude affects the language acquisition process. So um, even if this is a new idea, as I explain this, I bet you're going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, that makes sense. I, I see that. So um, exactly negative feelings like stage fright. I just saw in the in the chat. If a student has negative feelings in the classroom, their effective filter is high, which means that it is blocking the language from getting into their brain. So it's like filtering what enters their brain, which means they learn less, right? If you're scared, if you're nervous, um, then you're, you're not learning. Your, your brain is actually blocking the, the knowledge. But if the, the learner, the student has an optimal attitude, if they have a great attitude, then that effective filter is low. And that opens the brain to more learning, which is what we want, right? As teachers, that's our goal. So this comes from uh, Stephen Krashen, who is uh, you know, a very famous linguist. And um, as you can see, he wrote about this in 1982. Again, this is not brand new, but it's tried and true that the effective language teacher is someone who can provide input and help make it comprehensible in a low anxiety situation. So we teachers want to create a low anxiety, low effective filter situation for our students in our class. So how do we do that? We use these interactive communicative activities, okay? So here's um, two examples of activities that you could do in class. Let's say you're studying past tense. And so activity one, students brainstorm past tense questions, they interview a classmate, they take notes, and then they report back to the class. Or number two, students individually complete exercises on a worksheet, and then the teacher calls on students one by one to read the answers out loud. So which of these is more communicative and would help lower the effective filter? So please type in the chat, number one or number two. Great. Awesome. So I see a lot of people putting number one. I completely agree with you. Yes, that that less anxiety. Why? Because students are having the chance to talk to a partner first you know, if they make mistakes, it's not in front of the whole class, it's a little less scary, and they can take notes, they can work it out. 
and then they get to report back instead of just, you know, answering the grammar exercises and then they get called on right away. That can be a little scary, right? So um, I'm going to give you some more activities and strategies like the two that we talked about to increase student interaction. And so we've talked about being student-centered, having communicative activities, lowering the effective filter. And then that other part that we mentioned with accuracy and fluency, right? So those are two different things that we want our students to practice, both accuracy, using language in a correct way, and then fluency, being able to communicate freely and, and feel comfortable. Uh, in doing that. So first, here are two more activities that focus on accuracy, on, on using the correct language. So our third strategy today, I call it a dice drill. And I'm going to explain how this works. So um, first, let's say, again, we're practicing simple past, like we said before. Okay. So I would elicit, I would ask my students, what are six verbs that we want to practice? Okay, so maybe then my students give me go, do, make, have, take, give, and I can write those on the board next to the numbers one through six, um, or on a whiteboard, or a paper, or whatever you have in your classroom. You could do it on the computer if, if you have that. And now we have six different verbs that we're going to practice. And I would put my students into small groups and I give each group a die. Okay, so you do need to have dice. If you don't have dice, you could make them out of paper, um, but they, they need a die because then they're going to roll that die in their group. And depending on the number they get, that's going to be the verb they use. So let's see, I roll my die. And let's say, for example, I got number three. Okay, so number three, which verb? Make. Okay, so now I have to make a question using that verb in the simple past. Okay, so for example, uh, let's say the lesson topic is Halloween. So here in the United States, we have the holiday Halloween coming up on Monday in two days. So let's say, okay, we have a lesson about Halloween. I need to make a question about Halloween using simple past with number three, the verb make. Okay, so let's see, what question could I ask? Um, for example, I don't know, what decoration did you make uh, for Halloween? And then in my group, a different student will answer. They could say, mm, I made, simple past, I made a jack-o'-lantern, maybe. Okay, maybe a different student says, I made a ghost. Okay, whatever it is. Then the next student is also going to roll the dice. They get a different number, different verb. They ask a different question. Okay, so the students take turns rolling the dice and creating questions and, and answering them together in their group. So in that activity, Again, you can adapt this in many different ways. You can use different grammar points. You can have your students practice making statements or negative statements or questions to practice the different forms of the verbs, right? And the great thing about this, they're repeating again, again, and again, but in an interactive way with each other. And, and I find that my students love doing this. Like they wanna do it again and again to practice. So um, you could even, instead of verbs, maybe you could use vocabulary words, and then they could make questions with, with different vocabulary. So you can adapt this in many different ways. All right, so activity number four. This is a game called tic-tac-toe, which I've taught in a, a number of different countries around the world, and every country that I teach in, I find that everyone knows this game. Like every culture has this game, maybe with a different name. So the name in the United States is tic-tac-toe. But so here's how it works when I use it in my classroom. Okay, so um, I, the teacher, would make this board um, on my blackboard, whiteboard, uh, computer board, whatever 
you know, kind of board or screen or paper I have with the numbers one through nine. Okay, so each space has a number. And I'm going to divide my students into two teams. Okay, so even if it's a big class, I can make two teams. One team is X, one team is O. Okay, now um, for the language practice, there are different ways you could do it. But one way, let's say we are studying Halloween vocabulary. And I ask my students, okay, before we play, I want you to write a sentence using a vocabulary word we studied. Okay, so everybody, all the students are writing their vocabulary words. I'm going to go around and monitor, see what they're writing, check if it's correct. Okay, if a student has a good sentence, I'm going to give them maybe a card or a small piece of paper, and I'm going to have them write it on here and I'm going to collect it. Okay. When I have nine pieces of paper, then we're ready to play. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is one team will start first. Okay. Let's say team X. Okay. Team X is going to go first. Team X, which space, which number would you like? Okay. Team X chooses five which is a very popular space in this game, right? In the middle. So they chose number five and I'm like, okay, here's number five. I need to carve a blank to make a jack-o'-lantern. Okay, we've been studying Halloween vocabulary. I need to carve a blank to make a jack-o'-lantern. Now, if the student gives me the correct answer, they win the space. So the student says, pumpkin. Yeah, <laughs> and you guys got it too, awesome. So pumpkin, okay, great. So uh, team X gets number five. Now team O, okay, team O, which space do you want? Number four, okay. And then I read a different, a different statement. If they get it correct, all right, good job team O, you won number four. So we go back and forth until we get three in a row and team X is the winner. Right. So Team X got three correct in, in a row and they won. And this game I found can become very competitive <laughs> between the uh, two teams. So how can you adapt this? Um, you could, again, have the students play in small groups um, if you would like them to practice together. They can still make, you know, on a paper, they can make the tic-tac-toe board. Um, you could have the teacher or the students create those fill in the blank sentences, or you could use questions instead, right? Um, and again, you can use this to review grammar or vocabulary, wh whatever you are studying. And um, the, maybe the students need to say a sentence using the grammar point or uh, the vocabulary word. And oh, and I see a question in the chat. If Team X gets it wrong, does team O get to have a go? That's a great question. I think you can decide how you want to do it. Um, I've done it both ways. Yeah, you could say, okay, team O, you can try. And if they get it, they win the space. Or you could just say, oh, sorry, you know, move on to the next. Uh, yeah, your choice. And, um, you know, if you have a lower level class, you could even for each space, instead of a whole sentence, it could just be one verb. And maybe you're practicing irregular verbs in the past or uh, irregular verbs past participle, right? So maybe like space number five was the verb go. And then the correct answer would be went in the past or gone past participle, right? So again, you can adapt this in so many different ways, but it's a fun interactive activity. All right, so those were accuracy, right? Because those two games were really focused on using the correct language, having the correct answer. But now three activities that focus more on fluency, they're more open and free use of communicating with language. So let's take a look at um, the fifth activity or strategy that I'm sharing today, running dictation, which is another thing I love and my students always love it. So. What is running dictation? Here's how it works. Okay, so first of all, you, the teacher, you need to have some different questions that you have on papers 
and you're going to put them on the wall either outside of your classroom like um, where I teach I can put it in the hallway uh, on the wall using you know like tape or something and oh and I see some people love this yeah I think this is a great activity and um, or you can put it in the maybe in the back of your classroom like all the way in the back it depends on your classroom on your context so these questions are on the wall now you're going to put your students into pairs okay so each student will have a partner there's student a and student b student a is going to go to the paper and read it okay it's called running dictation but they don't have to run because especially if you have a big class or young students if everybody is running that could be a little crazy a little chaotic but maybe they can walk <laughs> over to the paper walk fast uh they're going to look at the paper they have to remember the question on the paper so they're going to read it they're going to remember it okay so for example the question is um when is halloween okay so i'm going to remember when is halloween when is halloween i go back to my partner student b and then i tell student b when is halloween student b is going to write the question exactly so that's the dictation right they're going to listen they're going to write when is halloween now when student a has given maybe two questions they switch now student b is going to go to the paper read remember come back and tell student a in the end they have all the questions maybe there's four right so now they have four questions now what do they do they need to answer the questions right they're not finished they they got the questions now they're going to answer them together okay so you could for example um maybe your class has read a text together and the questions that you put are comprehension questions about the text okay so like for example when is halloween and they have to go back to that text to find the answer okay so um this oh and i see some uh comments in the chat too yeah maybe you do this during an afternoon session when students are tired and you need them to stand up you need them to move and um you know research has shown that exercise actually helps our our brain um learn more so when they're moving it's it's you know helping them uh with this information so uh, again, this activity, you could adapt it. The questions can be short. They can be long, depending on your the level of English of your students. You could use it for comprehension questions about a listening or a reading text, or the questions could just be about the grammar that you've studied, the topic you've studied to give them practice with answering those questions. You could also use true false statements in instead. So maybe, uh, the statement would be Halloween is on October 30th, right? And they would have to, from the text, be like, no, that's false. Halloween is on October 31st, okay? So anything that you want to do, whatever topic, whatever content you're, you're working on. All right, and then uh, number six, we've got two more to go. So question lines. Um, which uh, this activity has many different names, maybe communication lines, um, dialogue lines, maybe you've heard it uh, with, with different, um, different names, but another fluency activity here. So what are we gonna do? I'm gonna put my students into two lines and they're gonna be facing each other so that they can see their partner, right? Each student has a partner facing each other. Now I'm going to give my students uh, maybe cards or pieces of paper that have a question. So one question on each paper, each card, all different questions about whatever we're talking about, whatever we're studying. Okay. Now um, the the students are going to ask and answer their questions with their partner. So student A is going to read their question. Student B answers. Then student B reads their question, student A answers. Okay, so for example, I'm student A, I read my question. What was your favorite Halloween costume? 
right? And then student B is like, oh, I like the costume of a ghost, maybe, or, um, you know, I like the costume, uh, I like to dress up as a fairy, or, you know, whatever they, they like for Halloween. And then student B is going to ask also. Now, when they're finished, when, when you've given all the students time to ask an answer, then the students are going to exchange their cards, okay? So that means each student now has a new card, new question. They have the new question, now they need a new partner. So student A is not gonna move, student A just stands there. Student B is gonna move one to the right, okay? So they're gonna move over. Now everyone has a new partner. The person at the end, they need to go to the front. Okay, so now everyone has a new partner, everyone has a new question, and they're gonna, again, same process, ask and answer together, okay? And you repeat this each time. Each time they exchange, they move to a new partner. Again, this gives a lot of you know, different practice, interacting with different students, and they always have new questions, they're talking about new things, um, they're uh, getting more opportunities to communicate with each other. Again, you can adapt the, this in so many different ways. So either the teacher can give the questions or you could ask the students to write their own question, right? Um, you can use this as an icebreaker with getting to know you questions like, where are you from? Or, you know, um, how many people are in your family? Or, you know, whatever, if it's the beginning of a new course. Um, or just in your class, you can use it as a warm up for the lesson to introduce the topic that you're going to talk about. You can use it to practice specific grammar points. You know, maybe all of the questions are using present perfect or whatever you're studying, or you can review vocabulary. You can also, like the previous activity, use it for comprehension questions about a listening or a reading text, right? Maybe all the questions are about the text that you just read together. Um, in addition, you could use this same strategy to practice a dialogue, you know? So there's in the dialogue, student A and student B, and they're practicing it back and forth together. So again, th this one strategy, this one activity can be adapted in so many different ways. All right, here's our last one, our final um, interactive strategy, cooperative learning roles, wh which is great when you have students working in small groups together. Okay, so how does that work? You put your students in a team of maybe like four or five students. You can adapt it depending on how many students. This works great for large classes. So if you have to put them in like a lot of different groups. Now, each student has a different role. They have a different job that they have to do. I'm giving you some examples here, but you can create your own jobs depending on what you want them to do. So I often have one student is the reporter. What does the reporter do? They report to the class uh, when it's time for everyone to share. One student is the timekeeper. What does the timekeeper do? They keep the time. <laughs> so if I tell them you have 10 minutes, timekeeper has to watch, their, watch the clock. One student is the researcher. What does the researcher do? Research. <laughs> so maybe that student is allowed to look up words in a dictionary or if your students are able to use their phones, you, you could say that the uh, researcher is able to look things up on, on their uh, phone. And then one student is the note taker. What does the note taker do? Takes notes, <laughs> of course, right? So they're the one who's writing what, what the group decides. And then I like to do, my students kind of think it's fun to have an English monitor. So what is the English monitor's job? They tell everybody, please speak English. <laughs> if they stop speaking English, they're the one who's like, please speak English and reminds everybody to, to use the, the target language while they're working. So 
you could, and I see in the chat, is it possible to practice cooperative learning roles in a small class with, with 12 students? Yeah, I mean, you know, so in that case, maybe you want students to work in groups of three. You could have four different groups of three, and maybe you have a reporter, timekeeper, and note taker, and that's it. You know, so you can choose how many different roles you want, and, and you can change those roles de depending on what they need. So this, what, what works well is that students are focused on their own role, their own job. Uh, so it helps them to kind of focus what they're doing during that group work, during that teamwork. And the teacher can give them a task or maybe discussion questions, whatever you're doing. You know, so for with our example, again, of Halloween, maybe the task is in your group, make a plan for a Halloween party you know, decide what you're going to do. And, and they're discussing about, okay, so in our party, everybody will wear a costume. Everybody will bring a pumpkin or, you know, whatever they're doing. Then at the end of the time limit, maybe 10, 15 minutes, the reporter of each group will report to the class, what did the team talk about? What, what was their plan? Okay, so um, cooperative learning, which I'm sure many of you have heard of and used, but the research shows that it increases student interest. Um, it helps them improve their critical thinking ability. And it gives the opportunity to practice both productive and receptive language skills in a natural context because they're working together in the team and they're discussing using English, what, uh, figuring out what they're gonna do. Okay, so um, let's see, that was our final activity, and I think we're on time here. So to review, here are the seven that we just looked at today. Um, and these are all student-centered communicative activities that help lower the effective filter, make students feel comfortable, give them, help them have a good attitude. They're having fun, they're motivated, which helps them learn, right? It actually opens their brain to more language acquisition. So please type in the chat, which, which strategy would you like to try? You know, I, I'm sure you've used some of these or many of these before. Um, is, is there anything new that you'd like to try? Or maybe there's one that you'd like to adapt in a different way. So which one would you like to do? I'm seeing all, that's great. <laughs> I'm glad that they're all helpful. Dice drill, okay, awesome. Yeah, my students love dice drill, honestly. Um, number six, question lines, great. Running dictation, all, that's awesome. And I see a question, what is the difference between an icebreaker and a warm-up? Okay, great question. So um, to me, the difference is an icebreaker is when the students are meeting for the first time. So maybe at the beginning of the course, beginning of the term, and it's a way for them to learn more about each other. And a warm-up I use every class meeting, every lesson. We begin with a warm up to get students ready to think, to, to get them um, introduced to the topic so that they're activating that schema, they're, they're thinking about what they know about that topic. So I hope that helps. And then I see a lot of people putting different. Yeah, and, and remind, exactly. A, a, another goal of my webinar today is maybe you've used these before and this is just a reminder like oh hey yeah remember that you love doing running dictation so maybe you know whip that out next week um great and a warm-up is like an energizer i see too yes so getting students ready for that lesson awesome so i think um we're we're just about at the time for Q&A. So what I also wanted to share, um, oh, and just one thing in the chat, I see that they're all warmups. Well, um, the thing is, so warmup usually is at the beginning of the lesson. These activities you can use at any point of the lesson, you know, depending on how you adapt it, it could be a warmup, an introduction to the topic, or it could be a practice activity, right? The dice drill, could be like you just talked about simple past tense, now the dice drill to practice it. Um, or it could be a re review activity at the end to, to review the vocabulary that you just studied. So yeah, I think all of these activities could, could be used at different points 
in each lesson during each class. But um, if you would like more activities that are interactive, help lower the eff effective filter, uh, are communicative, I just wanted to share this free resource. It's called the Monster Book of Language Teaching Activities. It is on the American English website, which I put here. And um, there are more than 150 activities in this free book. So you can download this from the website. It's a free PDF. And there are just so many different activities. Some of, um, some of the things I talked about today are in this book, um, but there are many other activities that are in there. So if, if you're looking for fun things to do, um, I would recommend checking that out. It's a pretty good resource, I think. So I think we're at the time for Q&A. Um, so we can open it up for any questions that you might have. And I, I think I'll turn it over to Irene if um, she sees any questions that I should answer. Well, thank you so much, Virginia. Uh, I would like to thank you for a nice presentation. And of course, I myself have taken away three. <laughs> yeah. Three That's awesome. Methods. I liked the dice drill, and then I liked the running dictation and cooperative learning roles. But before going to the questions of the participants, I have a class of 50 students, and I like to practice the running dictation. How can I do yeah. that to 50 students? That, that's a great question, Irene. Um, to be honest, I, I've used that activity in classes that are large like that. And, and I think the key is, well, one, one suggestion I would have is having the questions, the same questions posted in different areas so that all 25 students who are student A don't go to one place because that would be like too crowded. Right. But maybe if you can post it in three different areas, then it's a smaller number of students at each point. And then just making sure of reminding the students to watch out for each other when they're going back and forth, because um, that could be the hard thing that everybody's moving around. It's a little bit chaotic, but I think it can be controlled. <laughs> you know, it's controlled chaos and, and it's just the students are doing so many different things at one time, and, and then the teacher just needs to make sure they're all watching out and, and paying attention to each other. Mm. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have a question. In case you form a group of three, is it wrong if a student play two roles mentioned in point uh, number seven? I think that's the cooperative learning roles. Yes, oh, exactly. Um, right, because you know when we make groups, usually it doesn't work out perfectly <laughs> that you have the exact same number in each group. So I think that's a great idea. I usually do that too, where I say, oh, okay, this group only has three students. So one of you, please choose two roles to do, or, or I can assign two roles. Or, you know, for example, you could say, well, everybody's the English monitor. <laughs> you know, you have your one job, but everybody should also make sure that you're speaking English. Okay. Uh, there's a question that which level we should use communicative language teaching? Yes, I, I think I think it honestly, um, it can be used for every level. Uh, I, I've personally used it for beginning students up through very advanced students. Um, at the beginning level, the communication looks different, right? They, they're not gonna have an extended, complicated conversation, but they can still practice asking and answering questions. You know, they, they can practice very basic grammar and, and simple questions with each other, but they're still communicating together. Okay. Uh, we have Fatih asking, how can we use them in large classes? Yes, I think that, and, and I agree, I think for many teachers, that is the big issue, right? So I'm just gonna go back to these different, the list of these different activities. Um, two truths and a lie, you know, I would suggest if you have a very big class, putting students into groups 
and they can do the activity together in the group and the teacher can walk around and, and monitor and, and just kind of make sure that they're staying on task, right? Think pair share works with any size group because you can always give, you know, 50 students time to think, turn to a partner for the pair. And then for the share, not everybody can share, but the teacher can select a few students. Um, dice drills works well in small groups also, right? So you have a large class, but you divide them into smaller groups so that everybody is uh, doing the activity at the same time. And the teacher just needs to go around and monitor. Uh, Tic-tac-toe, if you have a very big class, you can still make two teams and maybe not every student gets a turn, but the, but the group can um, maybe kind of talk to each other or you can do it in small groups. Again, running dictation, like we said, can be a little chaotic, but um, just as long as everybody's being careful, it can still work. Question lines, it, you can, I, I've done this in classes of like 50 students. You, you need enough space, but you just put everybody in two lines. And it's very controlled because they ask and answer their questions and then they move to the next. So it can still work. And then cooperative learning roles as well in a big class, it's a great way to give students different jobs when they're working together in a smaller team. So you're splitting the class up into smaller teams and having them do the group work. And then maybe if your class is really, really big, maybe not every team can report but you can have, depending on how much time, you can have the different groups report back. So I hope that helps. Yeah, we also have another question. What if you assign the role to a student who is not like, who does not like to talking in the party of reporters, for example, how would you support yeah. him or her to report? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so when you do the roles, I, I've done it different ways. Um, one, one thing I do for that is um, I'll let the group decide who is doing which role. And in that case, then maybe if a student doesn't want to be the reporter, they don't volunteer <laughs> to be the reporter. And maybe they tell their group, like, I don't want to be the reporter, you know? So one way is that you can let them choose their role. Um, or if you're assigning it, Maybe if you assign reporter and the, and the student is like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, you could work with them to give them some support, maybe let them read from notes when they report um, that might help. Or, you know, I, I think if they really, really don't want to be the reporter, I would maybe ask another student to switch roles with them. And maybe if you do this a number of times in your class, eventually they will become more comfortable. You know, after they see other people doing it and understand how to do it, maybe after, you know, five classes of, of this same strategy, they finally are ready to be the reporter. But I do, I, I really do like giving students the, the choice because I think, again, lowering the effective filter, if they're not comfortable doing it, they're not going to be learning from it. So give them the choice to do a different role. Okay, I don't see more questions. <laughs> well, there's someone asking in the chat if you can please mm -hmm. explain a little bit the difference between ice break and a warm up. Sure, I think um, I, I mentioned before, um, but uh, to kind of reiterate about that, because I, I think I saw another question about warm up in there. So for me, a warm up is at the beginning of each lesson, you know, so maybe in our class on Monday, when we begin the lesson, we do a warm up. And then on Tuesday, we begin a different lesson, we do a warm up at the beginning. On Wednesday, we have a different lesson, we do a warm up. Um, icebreaker is a similar idea, but it's really an icebreaker is for students to get to know each other better. So you're making them feel comfortable together. And um, so an icebreaker is really focused on them learning about each other's lives, um, about their interests, about um, their background, about their experience. So an icebreaker and a warm up can be similar. 
Um, but a, an icebreaker is more to make students feel comfortable and build a relationship with each other. A warm up is tied to the lesson. It's it's introducing that lesson. It, it's introducing the topic. It, it's getting the students to think about the topic of the lesson. So I hope I hope that makes it a little clearer the difference. Yeah, thank you. And can a hot chair be assigned as a cooperative learning? Um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that uh, with that term. Could you help me and explain hot chair? Because I I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> So whoever asked that, if you can explain about hot chair, then, then I could answer better. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. They'll be easily seen rather than the chat box. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just put up here to the references that I'm happy to share this presentation. But um, if if you're interested in reading more about the research, here here are the links for that. Well, I think I do um, another question about warm up in in the chat. So it could be, um, is it done only during the first lesson of the day or is it done at the beginning of each lesson or subject? And I think um, I, I think it's great to do a warm up at the beginning of anything that you're introducing. So if you're introducing a new lesson with a new topic, it's good to do a warm up at the beginning to help the students get ready for, for that topic. So depending on how you have structured your day or your class, maybe you do a warm up in the morning and a warm up in the afternoon, or, um, you know, it depends how many different lessons, how many different topics are, are you working on that day. So someone explained about the hot chair. Oh, great. Uh, they say one student sit on a chair in the front of class and the others ask him questions and he answers. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Ah, I see. Yeah. In American English, we call that the hot seat. <laughs> so like someone is, yeah, they're, they're kind of the focus and they have to answer the questions that are being asked. Um, so I think, let's see. And I think was the question, could cooperative learning roles be used for that activity? Um, so if now cooperative learning roles, generally are used when students are working in small groups. So I think it depends on how you structure the activity. Um, I'm familiar with that hot chair maybe being in front of the whole class and, and different students are asking questions. So in that case, if it's the whole class, I probably wouldn't use cooperative learning roles, but you could um, maybe before that hot chair activity, First, the students work in small groups to create the questions. And then in those small groups, they could have those cooperative learning roles. And then the reporter of each group could ask the question to the hot chair. So that would be my suggestion for that. But um, I think you could probably think of different ways to, to adapt it. OK, someone is asking that some people are not interested, no comfortable with Halloween. Uh, mm -hmm. Can a teacher use the idea in teaching English language in the classroom if the students are not comfortable? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's 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 a great question. And um, I have encountered that, too, where, um, you know, here in the U.S., some people do not celebrate Halloween. They maybe they are not comfortable with that topic for religious reasons, cultural reasons, whatever. So I think. Um, you as the teacher know your students and you know your class. So, you know, and in this webinar, I'm not saying that you have to talk about Halloween. I'm just using that as an example because it's coming up in two days here in the US. But maybe as a teacher for your class, 
you don't think that's a good topic. So, you know, I, I would say again, with that concept of the effective filter, um, if a, a student is very, um, is very uncomfortable with a topic, their brain is going to shut out any kind of language acquisition when that effective filter comes up and is high. So you might decide that you don't want to introduce that in your class. But I think also Halloween in the US is a very, um, has become just kind of a fun holiday. It, it doesn't have to relate to the, um, that kind of negative, uh, connotation of ghosts or death or, or things like that. So you could just keep it fun too. But I think as a teacher, I, you know, you know what's best for, for your class. Yeah, someone is suggesting, I think it's a mirror that we can use local celebration from our country or culture right. to make it relevant to our students. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. I, I, yeah. And again, you don't have to teach American holidays either. You know, you, you would talk about what you're in, in your country and your culture, what, what is relevant, what is important for your students. So that was just an example because Halloween is coming up. Thank you, Amira, for that. What should we do to help shy students to be active? Mm. So th that's a great question. And especially because I, as a student, I was very shy. So I'm constantly thinking about, you know, what would I have felt comfortable with in class? And to me, the activities that I shared today, um, they support those shy students because uh, especially, you know, something like think, pair, share. For me, that was a total eye opener. Like, I was like, wow, if my teachers had given me the opportunity to talk to a partner before talking to the class, as someone who was shy, I would have felt much more comfortable. So I think these activities, the way they're structured, they scaffold uh, communication in a way that helps shy students build more confidence and feel more comfortable. You know, it, with a cooperative learning role, maybe the shy student is the note taker. They feel comfortable writing things down, but they don't want to be the reporter like we talked about before. So, so that helps them to participate in the group, but feel comfortable. So I, I really do think these seven activities are actually really great for shy students or, or students who don't feel that confident in their language yet, but it helps them build the confidence. Yeah, and I think this will be our last question. Time is mm -hmm. over. Uh, is there any difference between a warm up and energizer? Um, I think, well, um, I think we're using a lot of different terms that are kind of similar, and and maybe we can use them in similar ways. So an energ energizer might, um, it, it could be, let's see, I'm sorry, it was a warm up and yeah, warm up and energizer. So maybe the warm up is at the beginning of the lesson to get students thinking about the topic. And then maybe later in the lesson when they've been sitting a lot or um, they're getting a little bit more tired, then you do some kind of acti activity to energize them. You know, maybe later on in the lesson, you use a game or you use running dictation. You know, I think that would be really good as an energizer. I would not probably use running dictation as a warm up. I think it's good as an activity later on to practice or review what you've been talking about in the lesson. Thank you so much. If you have anything to add, you can do that now because before we close. Sure. I, I just want to thank you, Irene, for, for your support throughout this presentation and, and thank Africa Elta again for the opportunity. Thank you to the president, Amira, for uh, supporting this. And thank you to everyone who has joined us. And, and you've all been, I, I just so appreciate your participation, your excellent questions, and the chance for us all to interact with each other. I hope that um, this presentation was useful for you and that you have at least one new idea that you can use in your class next week. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Virginia. And thank you everyone from wherever you're joining us. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening and good night.
everyone. Thank you so much. Enjoy your evening.